welcome to our class today in religion or in magic witchcraft and the occult uh today we're going to be talking about sort of the social function of history going back and looking at the work of hubert a mouse i'm used to saying it in the french but uh hubert and mouse and we're also going to look a little bit more at what radcliffe edmonds is talking about when he describes drawing down the moon so without further ado let's get going there's go here's my little point thing there we go um, so we're once again trying to define religion and magic. So why am I constantly coming back to this? Because we sort of tend to almost instinctively want to split religion from magic. Now, I would argue, and this was an essential realization in my own work when I started working with magic in uh, the Sanskrit tantras, is that magic is religion. Now, I'm not sure if religion is magic. But magic is definitely religion. You can't separate these things, but you can compare them. And this comparison is really, really important. So this splitting of hairs between magic and religion is valuable. It illuminates both magic and religion. This is what I call a productive and responsible comparison. Responsible comparisons will illuminate both elements that are being compared. Both magic and religion are understood clearer by looking them together. We demonstrate patterns and overlaps between the two, and we suggest something new that we learn about those, those two from looking them together. What we're going to argue today is that magic is about individual agency, and religion is about affirmation of the structure of society. And this will also cluster around a sense of authority. Where do you take your authority from? From the magic book or from the priest? From the teacher of magic, your magic guru, or from your Sunday school teacher? So I would argue that magic is not always against religion per se, but it has a different notion of authority and agency and a different understanding of the individual in many ways. Now, Hubert and Maus and also Durkheim show that the show these different ways in which society is mirrored in religion, that religion is actually a force to maintain society, even to maintain the status quo. Magic, on the other hand, challenges society, and it challenges claims of society to legitimate religion. Sorry, I'm not saying that right. Magic challenges the argument within society that religion, as we see it, is authoritative and is legitimate. Magic says there's other ways to do these things, and there's ways for individuals to act outside of these groups and institutions that we consider connected to religion, say the Catholic Church, Protestant denominations, um, the very sort of what they call the judo, the uh, the judo Christian, Judeo Christian values of the United States. The only interesting thing there is about the uh, hyphen, because honestly, I don't think any a Jewish person I've ever met would call themselves Judeo-Christians, but I will find a lot of Christians who want to lump themselves in with Christianity. But that's another thing. One thing that's really interesting that I think about magic is there's transgression. There's like a violation. There's a willful breaking of rules. Magic actually claims that the individual, the individual magic actor, and the lore of magic, the magical lore, the spells that are designed or dug out of magic books, are actually more powerful than legitimate religion or religion that is sanctioned by society. This argues that there's a different sense of authority, of what is authoritative, and it appeals to individual experiences, innovations of magical practitioners, and magic books. Now, Bernd Otto, who comes up a number of times, he's my pal, we're actually writing, working on a book right now, um, gives a summary in the introduction of his edited um, Defining Magic collection that we read out of today. So, uh, so talking about Hubert and Maus regarding Frazier, they say, and they make these critiques of James Frazier, sympathetic rights and beliefs are not restricted to magic as there are sympathetic rights in religion. So Frazier argues that the thing to see, uh, to understand magic as opposed to religion is sympathetic rituals or sympathetic sort of technologies and beliefs. Sympathetic meaning like does like. Remember, like I said, if you want two people to hate each other, you put their write their name on a sheet of paper and you put the uh, hair of a cat and the hair of a dog together and then they'll hate each other like cats and dogs. That's sympathetic magic. So 
Like does like. Frazier argues that a sympathetic magic is the main signifier of magic. But Hubert and Maus show that there are also sympathetic practices in official religions, such as animal sacrifices that will increase the life of a community or a person, or a Jewish priest pouring water on a temple space for prosperity, i.e. pouring the water over the altar to bring rain. So those are official actions of a religion. The other critique is that Fraser's distinction of coercive, magical versus submissive religious rites is not satisfactory because religious rights may also constrain. So this is when I was talking about a magical right coerces a God to do a thing. A prayer or a supplication asks, entreats, and begs a deity to do a thing. But the magical ritual, Fraser argues, forces the deity to do a thing. Now, uh, Hubert and Maus argue that this is kind of not true because within public legitimate religion, we see evidence of people using prayers or votive masses that seem coercive in practice. It's not clear that in practice, these, legit these legitimate religions aren't trying to coerce deities to do certain things. Just listen to any child pray for a school day off in the wintertime. All right, Fraser's idea that religion addresses transcendent beings while magic would be mostly mechanistic is misleading because spirits and even gods may be involved in magic. So this is an interesting point. Um, religion, high gods. Magic, little gods. But we don't really see that. When I look through the history of magic, I see, in fact, the Hebrew and Christian God and Christ, the Savior, are commonly found in old Egyptian magic. So there you can see someone using magic and using these supposed high gods. If you look through a lot of contemporary esotericism, you'll see constant uh, invoking of angels and divinities from Judaism and Kabbalah. Now, when I look at the magic tantras, which we'll be looking at in detail later, I see that all sorts of gods are effective. There's not a distinction between gods of magic and gods who aren't in magic. One would think that the god Proshotama, the highest person, a representative of Vishnu, would not be used because he's not considered violent in any way. But he comes up in all sorts of magic spaces. So when Frazier says, Magic invokes little gods that aren't legitimate. Well, that's just wrong. We find magic that does that. So these are the parts of his def definition that doesn't work. Um, he talks about mechanistic rituals. Well, when I look at magic, I find some rituals are uh, mechanistic as in the sense or mechanical as in the sense that they just work based on saying the thing right and doing the right spell and doing the right thing. They don't have any deities involved. But then just right along the sides of those and lots of magical sources, You'll see um, invocation of a deity or an angel who enlivens the ritual, who makes the ritual powerful. Then the question is, if you call a deity down to give energy to the ritual, does that mean that you've coerced that deity, that you've forced that deity? Or does the deity come because you have entreated it through prayers and offerings? So it's these distinctions are really complicated.